So I'm going to start by passing out uh, a handout, if you will. I'm going to send a couple down. Hopefully everyone has a, a writing utensil. If not, we have a whole host of pens right here. Yep. And I'll make sure you get a writing utensil. Right. Two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. Yep. Two and three. And what we're going to do is, oh, pardon me, is ask you to, uh, to rate each of these meat products. Is Joe coming back? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Dr. Samuelson, are you going to join us? Please. Okay. You might, you might grab a chair up here to make it, yes ma'am, more conducive. So I'm going to start a lecture on beef palatability and the hows and whys of tenderness, juiciness, flavor. I'll also talk about color a little bit. And we're going to uh, have Dr. Tennant and the grad students, they'll come in in a, in a bit, and they're going to be uh, distributing meat samples, okay? Some of these you'll probably delight in. Some of these you might not prefer, but there's a lesson to be learned in all of them, okay? Yeah, all right. <laughs> you got it. You got to trust me. I will tell you they're all beef. Okay, they're all beef. No chicken, no pork, no lamb, no goat, no turkey. They're all beef. Sir? It's all beef. It is all beef. I, I, I can assure you of that. Okay, so I'll, let me get started here. So I'm going to begin by discussing meat quality. And I want you to remember that the number one factor influencing the purchase of meat is its color at the retail case. So a consumer goes to a supermarket and they look into the retail case and the meat has to be the expected color, whatever they expect. Most of that translates back to their mother and their grandmother and what they were trained or taught or impressioned with as to the appropriate muscle color. In beef, that tends to be a bright cherry red. Thus, we typically package meat in an oxygen type environment. In, in most of our American grocery stores, you'll find meat that sits in a foam tray. It has a diaper underneath it. Uh, we, it's technically an absorbent pad but it is also the same material, same absorbent material as a, as a baby's diaper. And then it will be overwrapped with PVC film. That PVC film has a very high oxygen transmission rate and it allows oxygen to saturate the myoglobin. The myoglobin remains bright cherry red. That typically will last about 48 hours and then it'll start to turn from red to brown, oxymyoglobin to metmyoglobin. Uh, about 20 years ago, we started seeing lots of MAP packaging, modified atmosphere, uh, and that was done to increase shelf life. So you take uh, the same package, and rather than putting it uh, with a PVC film, you put it with a barrier film. So there's nothing coming in, there's nothing leaving. And you compressed inside that package, 80% oxygen, 20% CO2. That's four times the amount of oxygen you're breathing right now, and 40 times the amount of CO2 that you're breathing. That high oxygen saturated the myoglobin with oxygen and that high CO2 helped knock down bacteria. And so instead of getting a two-day shelf life, you could get about a 35-day shelf life out of that product. And so that, that was a lot, of the, a lot of the why that those things were done. Once the consumer purchases the product and takes it home and cooks it or consumes it at a restaurant, we get into flavor, juiciness, and tenderness. And these are very difficult to separate. That's why I say they're interrelated traits. Okay? So I'll go back to color a minute. 
Color precedes price in importance. Most consumers in most countries are somewhat price conscious. But if meat is the wrong color, it won't be purchased regardless of price. Typically, the color that you see would be the, the off color, if you will, that you see would be a brown. But there are some unusual reactions that take place. And you might get an, an odd colored red. You might get a green. You might get a gray. Uh, and if, if you get some of those really off colors, the meat will be left in the case regardless of the price and regardless of its true food safety uh, perception. Muscle color is a function of myoglobin. In your body, myoglobin resides in your muscles and it is there to retain oxygen, to store oxygen for aerobic glycolysis, aerobic metabolism. Think the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, converting one molecule of glucose into 36 ATP, that type of, uh, that type of reaction. So it's affected by multiple factors that are part of our inherent physiology. Namely, number one, muscle fiber type. I spoke briefly about that yesterday relating to marbling. Red muscles, those that have lots of mitochondria, lots of myoglobin, they tend to prefer to put fat there. So if we have that same red muscle, we're going to have more myoglobin inherently and the, the muscle will be richer and it will be darker in color. This is evident if you've ever consumed a porterhouse or a T-bone steak. So if I took a, a, a raw porterhouse or T-bone, the longissimus muscle is a higher proportion of, of white muscle fibers and it will, on average, be lighter in color than the psoas major, the tenderloin muscle. Uh, I'll get into it in just a moment. The, the psoas has a perception largely across the world that it's not used and thus that's why it's tender. That's completely false. The muscle is used highly. In fact, the psoas major, the tenderloin, is used every time the animal takes a step. It is tender solely because of the way we hang a carcass by the Achilles heel. We force it to be tender by hyperextending it. And I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. But the, the psoas is very dark in nature because it has high myoglobin content. It's a very much a red muscle fiber. So that's, uh, that also shows up, uh, I know this is a beef meeting, but that also shows up quite well in pigs, particularly in the sirloin and in the ham. If you've ever purchased a ham and you looked at the face of it, there's various colors. Uh, some will be lighter pink, some will be darker pink. And that's a clear indication the lighter pink is more of a white muscle fiber type. The darker pink, maybe even approaching red, is more of a red muscle fiber type. And so there's a tremendous difference in the quantity of myoglobin in those different muscle fiber types. Next we get into pH. This gentleman asked a question about dark cutters. A dark cutter is high in pH. If we were talking about pigs, the meat quality defect we're concerned with is PSE which is extremely low pH. And so the pH of the muscle, irrespective of its myoglobin content, dramatically affects the color based on the ability to absorb or to scatter light. And then the atom. The form of myoglobin can be altered based on the gas that the heme iron attaches to. And we can alter the color simply based on that. Real quickly, I'll remind you that myoglobin is water soluble. This gentleman here showed me a picture uh, yesterday of a package of meat in a retail setting that was exhibiting purge. Purge is muscle water. And the, the average consumer thinks that is blood. And they, they shy away from it. They don't like it. Uh, if it. If the package leaks, it makes their, their shopping cart or their, their bags and their gro whole grocery experience a messy one. It's not blood. The animal was bled during the slaughter procedure at exsanguination. Remember that muscle is 73% water. And so when you have a package in a retail setting, that muscle can leak its water. 
In the package this gentleman showed me, there were five slices. So there were 10 surfaces, if you will, in a, in a, in a sliced steak. And all of those surfaces were leaking water. And the purge was apparent in the package. And so that, uh, that also is, uh, is a clear indication that myoglobin is water soluble and it's in, that, uh, it's in that purge. Again, stores oxygen in your muscle. And I want to point out this red structure. So in the center of myoglobin, and I could also say the same for hemoglobin in your blood, in the center of that is a structure we call the heme, H-E-M-E, -E, heme ring. And at the center of the heme ring is one molecule of iron. That heme ring and that iron molecule are, are the reason you have a daily requirement for iron. The ladies in this room need 15 milligrams a day. The men in this room need 10 milligrams a day. If you don't get your iron, ultimately you'll go anemic. You need it for myoglobin and hemoglobin. And that center atom is what attaches a gas. We tend to think of oxygen, but we could also think of carbon dioxide. We could also think of carbon monoxide. It can also bind to sulfur and, and several other atoms and create unique muscle color outcomes. So take a look at that picture and, and tell me what you think happened to cause that. Exposed to air, you're very close. Let's, let's go back to this gentleman. He's close. It has to do with air. It did go from myoglobin to met myoglobin. Why? You're close. You're so close. Because of the layers, you're getting closer. So it's, it's actually lack of air because it's suffocated. So this was a piece of ground beef and it was taken and broken in half, okay? So the top portion that's now on the inside, that's what was on the top of that, is bright cherry red. And the brown ring was just inside the top and inside the sides. So we're breathing right now approximately 20.7% oxygen. If I lower that to about 1.8% oxygen, you can force oxymyoglobin to go to metmyoglobin. And so just under the surface of meat, you see bright cherry red, but there comes a point where you've gone so far into the surface, the oxygen can no longer penetrate, at least to the quantity that you have in atmospheric pressure. And you can force metmyoglobin to happen. Now the average consumer breaks that open and they think you're trying to cheat them. Or they think you've, you've tried to hide old meat with good meat. Dr. Tennant has our first sample. Is, is this sample A? This is sample A. Okay, so the way this is going to work, we want you to all take one sample, at least one sample. Make sure everyone gets one, please, before you keep, continue eating. And rate these samples. I want you to put your score down. Rate these samples on a score of 1 to 9. 1 to 9. 1 is extreme-like. One is extreme like, nine is extreme dislike. So one, that may be one of the best pieces of meat I've had. I'd like to eat that again. Nine, I hope I never have to eat that again. Okay? Five is neutral. Five is neutral. So please put your opinion down. And then I'm going to ask you to give me your opinion. We're going to do this in an orderly fashion. And I'm going to calculate the mean. And then ultimately, we'll tell you what it was, we'll tell you what the mean score of the group is, and we'll explain the hows and whys. Okay? Okay. We have some red wine to wash it there. 
Well, that would be that would be appropriate. Will you write down what each one is there, please, sir? Okay. Now uh, I'm going to open this up. Well. So, so angel. This is not bad meat. That is a natural physiological reaction to lowered oxygen pressure. Yvonne, can you say what you just said to me louder? If I saw that at the grocery, I would have thought they took older meat that had a dark cover on the outside and rolled it into the newer meat. And that's exactly what most consumers think. It's, it's normal. This is very normal, but it's, it's tough to express the normal physiology to a, to a consumer. Has everybody had a moment to try that sample? Okay, so how, what I want to do is I'm going to start with Yvonne and go down this row. I'm going to start, go down, keep going, okay? Yvonne, will you give me your score, please? Eight. Eight. Seven. 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 Three. Five. Three, three and four, okay? Seven, seven, eight, seven, 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 five, seven, three, three, five, four, three, seven, seven. Three, six, six, five, three, seven, three, eight, nine, six, get eleven. <laughs> Whoa, hang on, hang on. I, I typed in eleven. Let's go back to nine. Seven, you got me, you got me. I was in the zone. Three, seven. Okay. So the average score, please write this down, is a 5.6. 5.6. And I'll, I'm not going to tell you what they were until the end. But we'll just, we'll just keep doing that. Okay. okay. Let me grab my... I know what it should have been. I'll, I'll see what he, uh, he wrote down for me. All right. So the consumer, as Yvonne clearly stated, thinks this is old, it's spoiled, it's unwholesome. They probably wouldn't feed it to their family. And that's normal physiology of muscle, solely because of the oxygen partial pressure. Consumers also discriminate because of a true unwholesome appearance. Take a, take a guess at what that is. A what? Barbecue sauce. Barbecue sauce. <laughs> it probably wouldn't taste like barbecue sauce. Bruised muscle? You're close. Closer. Injection site. Injection site. So this muscle is actually the tri-tip. That's the tensor fascia latte. It's in the kind of the junction of the round and the loin. A very unusual place to find an injection site lesion. Extremely unusual. In fact, uh, I know the owner of the cattle and I, I called and I said, hey, what do you think this is? He knew, he, he knew exactly what it was. That's an injection site. And his assumption was that his cowboys gave a shot there when the animal was a calf. Which would be, again, an unusual location to give a shot, but that's, uh, that's exactly what we found and where we found it. What would a consumer think? Not good, no. They might not buy that cut again. They might not go to that store again. They have a, a, a lasting and unfavorable impression. So we've got to do what we can in our industry to minimize all of these occurrences. What about that one? Uh, 
Freezer burn. Okay, Angel says freezer burn. It's a good guess. It's dry and moldy. It's dry and, moldy. Not, dry and moldy, okay. Freezer burn, dry and moldy. What else? Long aging. long aging. Freezer burn, dry and moldy, long aging. We're not even close. Something from what? You're getting, you're close. Forget the hide. Not the acid. Cooked it. So that's a steam pasteurizer. And when carcasses go through a steam pasteurizer, you almost always get a burnt surface. And it shows up highly frequently in the brisket. So the packer trims that off most of the time. Every once in a while they forget one. Uh huh. So a customer gets that. What are they thinking? What did you do to my brisket? It's not good. And, and, and in fact, it's better. That was the surface that was exposed in the carcass. It went through the steam pasteurizer, got scalded hot. And uh, Dr. Ten and I have had this happen maybe a little worse than that. So obviously our lab is new. We've been tinkering a little bit. We left uh, one of the early carcasses in the pre-evisceration wash a little too long. 190 water will cook the outside of that carcass. Hot. So we had to do some trimming to cut all this off the outside. Okay, what about that one? I heard bruise. So I know what you're, you're thinking, shingling. This is not shingling. Good guess, though, because that would cause the same thing. Yep. So I believe Dr. Tennant has done... You had B and is this C? Yep. Yes. B and C. You're you're the man. B and C. So these are a talking point together. All three of them. Yep. For different reasons. Yep. 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 And the what? next one is flat irons. Rare and medium rare. Rare and medium rare. Rare and well. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I will wait till I will when I get there. I'm just so going to keep collecting data. All right, I want to collect data on B while you're thinking about what this is. Spoilage. Uh, not, not like you're thinking. Okay, sample B. Uh, and I'm asking about sample B, okay? Sample B. Six. Four. Two. Two, two, two. Sample B. Two, okay. B. Five, Five. Three. three, three, one, three, three, five, four, two, 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 four, three, one. Okay. Eight. Three. 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 Five. Three. 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 Five. Five. Two. Three. Three. Okay. All right. Sample B's mean was 3.2. 3.2. Is everybody ready for sample uh, C? Yes. Okay. Yvonne? Nine. Nine. Eight. Eight. Two. Eight. Two. Six. Five, eight, three, five, six, seven, six, 
seven, eight, five, eight, four, seven, eight, seven, 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 three, four, eight, six, and five. Okay. Uh, sample C is six point four. Sir? Potentially, potentially, sure. The repeatability may, may change. That's, that's fair. I'm not going to do that to you, but um, that's, that's, that's a good question. Yes. So this is a clostridial vaccine injection site outcome. It's not a scar per se. What's unique about this is it doesn't show up until after it's been cut. That, it wasn't noticeable when it was cut and packaged. After this went into high oxygen packaging, then it showed up. So the theory is that the adjuvant caused a tissue reaction that made the, those cells near that location oxidize at a greater rate and convert from oxy to met. Okay, I mentioned this during our grading session. Myoglobin quantity increases as animals age. So veal would be on the left, and then we have traditional beef at a slaughterhouse, and old, 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 old cow beef over here. Okay, myoglobin quantity increases as the animal ages. Myoglobin quantity increases as the animal ages is also seen in differences among species. So most chickens in the United States are killed at five to six weeks of age. That's, tip, that's their traditional lifespan. And uh, the breast meat is very light, very, very light pink in color. And the thigh meat or the, the leg muscles are very much darker in color. The reason is activity level. So a chicken walks. They, they walk around. They don't fly anymore. And for that reason, the thigh muscles have more myoglobin because they're more used. In contrast, those of you who have shot birds of flight would notice that the bird's breast in birds of flight are very dark red. Mm -hmm. A dove, around, a dove, a pheasant, a quail, a goose. A, they're very dark breast meat because they fly. So the myoglobin is concentrated in muscles of high use. Myoglobin is concentrated in muscles of high use. So back to the, back to the age thing, we kill pigs at five to six months of age. A pig is darker than poultry because it's older and it's accumulated more myoglobin. However, if you've ever killed an old sow, let's say a five, six-year-old sow or you've shot a wild pig, that muscle is much darker. Uh, a five or six-year-old sow will be as dark or darker than beef cattle because they've accumulated lots and lots of myoglobin as they're older in age. Lamb, typically harvested at about 12 months of age, 12 to 14 months of age, is darker than pork. And cattle, typically harvested at 18 to 20 months of age, darker again than lamb. And as I had in the previous slide, older coal cows are even darker than fed beef. So a tremendous amount of myoglobin differences tie back to simply the animal's age, how old that animal is at time of harvest. Okay, what do we call this picture? Dark cutter. This is a, so on the left, a dark cutter. On the right, traditional bright cherry red beef. So recall our conversation yesterday. The dark cutter occurs from long-term stress that depleted the muscle glycogen stores prior to death. And then once the animal dies, they don't have muscle glycogen to be converted into lactic acid 
Thus, the pH doesn't fall because lactic acid never pools, or it pools minimally. The pH remains high, the muscle color remains dark. Okay? That's a quality difference. That's not a quantity difference. It's a quality difference. Yes, sir? Does X have anything to do with the color of fat? Does color fat. age have anything to do with the color of fat? Yeah. Uh, not really. Primarily, it's diet driven. Yeah. So, if an animal is on a high starch, i.e. typically low beta carotene diet, the fat will be very white. There's some, there's some alterations that we can make in white. Uh, for instance, if they're on corn, if the corn is the base of the diet, it'll be kind of a creamy white uh, with a tinge of yellow in it because there's some beta carotene in corn grain. If I put them on a, a barley diet, they'll be whiter, less yellow. And if I put them on a grain sorghum diet, they'll almost be paper, sheet paper white because grain sorghum has extremely low quantities of uh, beta carotene. If I put that animal on a, on a high forage diet, so around here we could, we could leave today and we could go find cattle on wheat pasture. Their fat would be bright, bright yellow if you kill a, a steer right off of wheat pasture. Uh, and, and it can almost get to orange in color, okay? Yeah. About the meat color. The meat color. Is it possible to go back so for the to take myoglobin away? Yeah, the, 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 to go from like red to here. pink or white or veal, for example. But in France, we want a white color for veal. Okay. So, so you need to kill the animal extremely young yeah. and only give them milk. Yeah, without uh, no grain. Milk yeah. fed young veal would give you a, the lightest color. We, we give him iron? To, to give him extra iron? No, no, he wants, he wants no iron. So to, to you, you almost want to make him anemic then to give them that light color. Uh, so you would not want to raise them outside uh, because they'll lick the soil and they'll get some iron from the soil. If you want the meat to be extremely light, pale, you feed them only milk, mm -hmm. you feed them on a concrete surface, and they have no, no dirt surface. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you'll get very, very light colored so veal. It's, it's not possible to have a magic solution to, at the end of the pain, No, no. Give them you cannot go backwards. Uh, okay. once, they've, go back. once they've accumulated myoglobin, it's there. Yes, the stress affects the color, yes. But, in it, but it's almost always going to make it darker. Uh, it's, it's very rare to cause the, the, the lightning color stress, which would be PSE. It's extremely rare to cause that in cattle. I've seen about three PSE cattle in my lifetime. And I've seen lots of carcasses. It's, it's fundamentally unheard of. Very, very rare. Same veal with different color. So that would be uh, fed with milk, concrete surface, no dirt. Okay. It's not possible to, to remove the milk. No, it's there. Sure. So there, there may be some inherent stress near the end of their life in, in death that makes some of them darker. It would be highly unlikely that some of them are getting lighter. That would be a, an unusual PSE type of stress. So back to um, Yvonne's comment. I want to talk about this, this slide. Sample D. Okay. I assume Dr. Tennant, D. Okay, Dr. Tennant's got D. So Yvonne made the comment about that ground beef that if she saw it, she would think it was spoiled, old, and that we'd kind of hidden uh, old beef with, with younger, better-looking beef. So when I was a graduate student at K-State, um, we had that same type of issue, but it was not a consumer per se. It was a large grocery chain. So... Uh, I'm, I'm a graduate student, I'm sitting in my, uh, my office, and one of my professors comes down, and he says, hey, we're going to go to Cargill today, J jump in the car, and let's go. So, 
Cargill was having an issue in their Dodge City, Kansas plant. The issue was their cold chain management was so good that the muscle was showing up off color. And let, let me explain. So in Dodge City, it's a slaughterhouse. Uh, they kill about 6,000 cattle a day. And they're, they're slaughtering them, they're chilling them, they're fabricating. And at the end of the fabrication lines, trimmings were going into uh, a grinder that was connected to a stuffer. And this system is working so fast, it's, it's what we would have called a pseudo vacuum. They didn't vacuum package it, but once you have enough product in there so long and that you don't break the seal or break the connection, there's no oxygen in here. And they're, they're taking, taking trimmings, they're grinding it, the grinding is stuffing right into uh, chubs, and there's no oxygen inside this chub. So they put these 10-pound chubs into large vat-like containers. They load up a truck. The truck's held at 28 Fahrenheit, and the truck leaves immediately and drives to Denver, Colorado, backs up to Safeway's dock. They open the doors. The quality assurance from Safeway comes out. They open up the, the vat. They pull out a, a chub. They slice off the end of it. What color is it? Brown. It's brown. Not the expected color. They reject the load. Send it back. So the driver goes over to a, a truck stop, a rest stop, sleeps for a few hours, drives back to Dodge City. Backs up to the dock. Quality Assurance in Dodge City opens up the door, opens up the vat, pulls out a chub, slices it open. What color is it? Well, it's purple, and then it blooms to red. Then they get on the phone. Why'd you reject our load? There's nothing wrong with this meat. This happens a couple of weeks in a row, and Safeway's frustrated, Cargill's frustrated, so they call Dr. Hunt. Dr. Melvin Hunt, one of my professors at K-State, uh, one of the experts in muscle color the world over. So he and I jump in the car and head to Dodge City, and we start figuring out what's, what's going on. It's kind of like meat science uh, CIS or uh, NCIS. And so we're, we're figuring out what's going on and we're asking enough questions and we realize the meat is being packaged in, in almost a vacuum package. The oxygen partial pressure is very low and it's so cold, the enzymatic reactions that need to force it from brown back to purple, they just take a while. And the, the time is not enough. So our recommendation was multi multiple things. Number one, you get this product in the truck, he can't ship like right then. He's got to wait 12 to 24 hours to ship. Number two, warm the truck up to 34. Number three, when it gets there, hang around a minute before you just take off and leave. And, uh, and we're going to create a, a little brochure for Safeway and for Cargill to pass out. And uh, I've had students that now work for Cargill that tell me these things are everywhere in their, in their system of how to, how to follow muscle color. So ultimately, uh, the, the situation was improved. All they needed to do was uh, raise the temperature a little bit, slow the process down a little bit, and then when the meat got to Safeway, it was the appropriate color because all of the reactions had had time at an appropriate temperature to occur. But it was very similar to, uh, to Yvonne's comment, it's the wrong color, reject the load. So this simply shows that we start out with no oxygen and muscle color is a deep, rich purple color. I took that picture under vacuum. So that was a, a chub of ground beef. I put it in a plexiglass container, sucked out all the air, waited for the, the vacuum to reduce uh, metmyoglobin back to deoxymyoglobin and we get a, a deep, rich, burgundy, sort of purple color. I uh, let that oxygenate, and you get a bright cherry red color. I let it oxidize for a couple of days, and you get an ugly metamyoglobin color, okay? So 
When we slice open a mussel, if you look real close, it's a deep, rich, burgundy color. And as you wait over time, it oxygenates to the color we expect. If we leave it in the retail case too long, it ultimately looks like this, and we're going to see a discount. $1 off, $2 off, $5 off, $10 off. Somebody please buy this before we throw it away. <laughs> right? Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into palatability, what we've been uh, sampling so far. Uh, one of my former graduate students did a survey of 1,088 people all across the United States and asked them what was their favorite or most, uh, maybe not favorite would, was the right word, what's the most important meat palatability trait to you? Tenderness, juiciness, or flavor? Tenderness edged out flavor, and both of those are clear winners over juiciness. So we tend to track tenderness in the beef industry and the meat industry more than any other trait. And that, uh, this survey data would clearly support that. So I'm going to talk about flavor first and then juiciness, and I'm going to get into tenderness. Flavor is highly related to cooking method within a given cut. So I've got on the left a grill. Okay, and you see these grill lines, grill marks on that uh, porterhouse steak. Most of us prefer to cook meat and cause the Maillard browning reaction, the caramelization reaction that we like on the outside of meat. Yesterday, Dr. Tennant cooked brisket in our smokehouse. The outside was very caramelized. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a person that likes the outer edges. So uh, I reached in and picked up an outer edge, and uh, that's what I ate. I like the, the outer stuff with high caramelization, lots of Maillard browning reaction. I could cook that in a microwave. It would be gray and ugly in color. It would technically be palatable, but maybe by not some of your standards. But you could cook it that way. We could also take these same cuts and we could stew them or braise them. And we would get a completely different flavor profile. So re realize that a tremendous amount of the flavor of meat is how you cooked it. Also, between species, the flavor of meat is totally dependent upon the fat profile. Chicken tastes different than lamb, tastes different than pork, tastes different than beef. That's the fatty acid profile. Within beef, if I had a, a grass-finished animal versus a grain-finished animal, their two flavor profiles are dependent upon the fatty acids in the meat, which is inherent upon the diet they're eating. Flavor is also determined by marbling levels. In our quality grading system, prime, choice, select, standard, we depend heavily upon marbling. It has a really, really poor relationship to tenderness, but an extremely high relationship to flavor. A no-roll steak will be very bland. You're just getting a, almost a protein taste. And as you go to, to select, and then to choice, and then to premium choice, and then to prime, the richness of the flavor really highlights that product. Juiciness is highly related to pH. Back to the dark cutter discussion, and I could, I could use PSC and pigs. So I want to I wanna point out something here, and we're going to have a little biochemical discussion. In meat, we talk about pH decline and the ultimate pH of a muscle cut. So right now, you all sitting here, your blood pH is fundamentally 7.4, otherwise you'd be in a hospital. If it gets much above or much below 7.40, you're going to have a detrimental body outcome, and you're going to need to be in the hospital. Your muscle pH is 7.2. Animals are the same. So after slaughter, we convert from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, and lactic acid begins to pool in the muscle, and the pH begins to drop. And we want it to drop to about 5.6 to 5.7 and create a bright cherry red color. However, it can drop too far. And in pork, we would say down here you get to PSE. 
And it might drop far enough, and if it remains high, we would have DFD, or dark, firm, and dry, also known as a dark cutter. One of the things we've realized over the years is we can improve palatability by enhancing meat. So we can take a, a pH 5.6, 5.7, and we can add high pH water to it, traditionally by using sodium phosphates. So we take a, a water solution, add sodium phosphates to it, add salt to it, maybe some flavors, maybe some spices, and inject that into the muscle, and we can improve its quality, we can improve its juiciness, and it, with a consumer that is more poorly trained to cook, we can improve their eating experience because this product has more water in it and it's thus less likely to lose as much. Okay, before I get into this, let me catch up on data. <clears throat> yes, sir. Let me get this back to rolling. Now we're good on time here. Okay, D is next. Five, three, four, seven, seven, five, three, one, one, three, two, seven, nine, two, six, four. Two, three, five, one, one, two, four, four, three, two, six, eight, two, two, dos, dos, five, one, dos, dos. Okay. Sample D is a 3.6. Sample D is a 3.6. Are we ready for sample E? Yep. Let's do sample E. Yvonne. Three. Five. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on a minute. I messed up. Hang on, hang on. I'm sorry. Three, five. Three. Eight. Seven. Four. Seven. You, sir, this, this is sample E, three, sample E, three, five, 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 seven, one, three, eight, four, four, seven, five, three, Nine, eight, seven, a one, no, a three, a one or three, three, seven, four, three, six, four, tres, one, two, five, three, five. Okay. Sample E was a 4.7. Sample E was a 4.7. Okay, um, let's, let's do sample F. Five, six. Five. 
six, five. five. Sample F, three. two and three. Okay, sample F, seven, two, three, three, nine, two, five, six, six, three, seven, four, six, four, four, five, three, four, three, 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 five, five, four, five, four, four, four. Okay. Okay, sample F is 4.5. 4.5. Okay, sample G. Two. Two. Six. Eight. Three. Six. Eight. Three. Two. Three. Four. Nine. Eight. Five, 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 nine, four, two, five, four, five, three, seven, five, two, yes, sir, two, two, four, three, four, two, three. Two, two, or three. Okay. Gotcha. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, G was four point three. Four point three. That's interesting. Okay. H and I are next. All right. Let me add a little bit more data to this. This because this is good stuff now. Oh, this is good stuff. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the presentation here. So what determines tenderness? The number one single most important factor determining whether a cut is tough or tender is its sarcomere length. So let's do a demo together, okay? Please hold out an arm, right arm, left arm, you choose. What muscle is this right here? Biceps, Biceps. okay. Give me a good in the shower. <laughs> yeah. Give me a good curl, right? Okay, so do I want to eat this or do I want to eat that? If you're eating it, you want to eat this one. Extended muscles are more tender. Contracted muscles are tougher. Extended muscles are tender. Contracted muscles are tougher. Okay, now, so when I'm doing this in the shower, right, what's this one? This is the triceps. If this is contracted, then this is extended. If this is extended, then this is contracted. So every muscle has an antagonist. Every muscle in the body has an antagonist. So if we make one muscle tender, we make its antagonist what? It's Tough. Yeah. Which is exactly what we have here in this first example. Okay, so in life, right here on my uh, black baldy, the sirloin is right here on either side of the tail head. We call it the top sirloin butt 
because it is at the top of the animal's butt. It's right here. The antagonist of the sirloin is the tenderloin. Again, it is used every time the muscle, or every time the animal takes a step. The common misnomer is people think it's not used. So think about how a four-legged animal moves. They put weight down and they push forward, right? When they're pushing forward on one leg, the other leg is free swinging. And in cattle, it's typically just above the ground as they take that next step. The muscle that pulls the leg forward to take the next step is the tenderloin. It is used in every single step they take. That's what pulls the leg forward. The tenderloin is connected to the lumbar vertebrae and to the femur. Its attachment to the femur is what pulls the leg forward. Okay, it's used all the time, which is why it's a red muscle fiber. It is tender because that is a completely abnormal position for the animal to be in in life. And we hyperextend the sarcomeres when we hang them that way. So it's largely an artifact of the way we hang a carcass. Okay, so... The, not the time, just the way. So hanging an animal by its Achilles heel hyperextends the psoas major and makes that muscle tender. So is that by design or is that just a... Uh, complete, a complete artifact of slaughter. Yeah. Complete. Yeah. The tender stretch. Tender stretch. So this gentleman's familiar with tender stretch. Has anyone else seen or heard of tender stretch? In Ireland, it's very used. Okay. So a tender stretch was created in Australia, and it was promoted by Texas A&M in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, it's never been something that we do here in the United States. So you, you hang the animal by the pelvic girdle. Uh, there's a hole in the, in the uh, hip bone called the obturator foramen, and you can put a hook through there, and then the leg falls back down, similar to how the animal is hanging or standing in life. That makes a few of the muscles in the round more tender, and it makes the longismus more tender, and it makes the tenderloin tougher. So, but tenderloin, the surface of the tenderloin is lower than the advantage that you would have with the round and the sirloin. That's probably true, but the, me the mechanism to do that is not efficient at our speeds. The, I know of one plant in the United States that tried that, and they went bankrupt in about 18 months. I'll leave it at that. So, when you hang a carcass in this manner, you hyperextend the tenderloin, but what do you do to the sirloin? You super contract it. Okay, so let's go back to this. Give me a good in the shower squeeze. And as, as hard as you can, as tight as you can, like you're gonna rip your muscle. Yeah. So you cannot get the sarcomeres any closer together than one and a half microns because that's how long myosin is. And myosin hits the Z-line on both sides, and it can't get any closer. Sirloin is about as contracted a muscle as we have, again, because of the way we hang the carcass. It just can't get any closer. It's already as contracted as it gets. So, sample... Instead of this way, you'll be better off? No. No. I mean, well, so your tenderloin will be a little tougher and your loin will be a little more tender. Yes. Is it worth, is it, worth it? If I were your local butcher, I would charge you so much you wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> because it's a pain in the to do it. 
If I was your local butcher, I would charge you so much, you wouldn't want me to do that. Oh, I would charge you a lot more. Oh, yeah. There's a price for about everything. It, it's not high enough, though. It wouldn't be worth your time. Okay. Sample A had an average of 5.6. Sample A is a sirloin. Sample A is a sirloin. Short sarcomere. Crunched together because of the way we hang a carcass. Sample B is a what? Tenderloin. Sample B is a tenderloin. Long, hyperextended sarcomeres, again, because of the way we hang the carcass. Sirloin is A, tenderloin is B. All right, so the next piece of this is collagen quantity and collagen quality. Collagen quantity is based upon weight bearing. So a muscle is where force is generated, right? I generate force in my muscles. I transmit that force to connective tissue. The connective tissue transmits that force to the bones. The bones act as levers for movement. The more weight bearing my muscles have to be, the more connective tissue you're going to find. Inherently in cattle, the cuts of the chuck, the shoulder, and the cuts of the round, the hind leg, have much more connective tissue than the cuts in the middle, what we call the middle meats, because they are weight bearing, load bearing. They're where the tremendous amounts of force are generated. So a good example of that here is I've got four and a half milligrams of connective tissue in a ribeye per gram, and I've got uh, 8.8 milligrams of connective tissue in the, uh, in the eye of round. So those are, those are just two examples, the ribeye being a middle meat cut, the eye of round being an end meat cut. We went past eye of round for this, for this demonstration. So sample C is a mock tender steak. It has about 9.2 milligrams of connective tissue per gram. 9.2 milligrams of connective tissue per gram of meat, wet tissue. And it should have been noted by you as being very tough. So you call it a 6.4. Near moderate dislike, 6.4. Secondly, as an animal ages, it becomes less and less and less tender because the collagen is more well cross-linked. We measure that indirectly in our maturity system with our A, B, C, D, and E. And if you look at the bulk of literature, a B is a little bit tougher than an A, a C is tougher than a B, a D is tougher than a C, and an E is tougher than a D. Because as an animal ages, its collagen becomes more well cross-linked. So I'll give you my farm kid analogy of this. How many of you have ever been stuck in a field? Like maybe you had a tractor stuck in a field. Okay, a few of us have done that. I'm not the only one. Nope. Tractor. Nope. tractor. And I, the, the vivid memory I have is I, I'm, I'm by myself, I'm 20 miles from the house, I'm going to get unstuck. So what I did is I buried it to the axle. <laughs> okay? So now I call my brother, I need help. So I have a tractor, a big tractor, stuck to the axle in a field. What do I need? A bigger tractor and... Well, okay, let's go to metal, not tow rope, chain. chain. For my analogy, I need a chain, okay? So I need a bigger tractor, and I need a chain. Call Cody, bring a tractor and a big chain. We actually had a, this old ship chain. It was almost unmanageable, but it, was, it worked for what we needed. So the point of my story is, if I had a link of a chain, and I just had it looped, so chains looped together, but not welded at the seam. Think of that as kind of an A maturity animal. And as we go from A to B, we put a spot weld on it. 
And as we go from B to C, we put a spot weld on the other side. And then C to D, we start to fill that in. And once we get to an E maturity animal, that weld at the seam is completely filled in. So the A maturity animal, the collagen is easy to break apart with heat or with acid. So think we could make an acid marinade, like citric acid, and we could soften and gelatinize that collagen. We could do the same with heat. As the animal gets older and older and older, those crosslinks are more well bound and they're less able to be broken down by heat or by acid. Okay? And that's, that's fundamentally what's happening at the uh, molecular level. All right, so the next phase I want to move on to is cooking loss. And one thing I want to say is we put 18 to 20 months in the born life of this animal and at least another nine months in the gestation life of this animal. And there's some thought process to the sire and the dam that made the animal. And a consumer can completely mess this up in under 10 minutes. Okay? And I, I want to highlight the importance of cooking on the end product. Samples D and E are the same cut from the same animal cooked two different ways. Okay? Sample D is a flat iron. Cooked rare. So as the flat iron muscle is the second most tender muscle in the animal's body. It's the infras, infraspinatus muscle, and it's on the outside of the shoulder. Uh, we've promoted that for about the last 20 years in the United States as a new value cut by our, our beef checkoff system, our Cattlemen's Beef Board, and our state beef councils. And it's a very popular cut. It's very tender, very flavorful. Cooked rare, you rated it a 3.6. Same cut, same animal, cooked well done, you rated it a 4.7. So the only difference there is how it was prepared. And you, by and large, had some fantastic differences. One of the things that I, I calculated real quickly, let me, uh, let me pull this up, was your variation, which is fantastic in this group. Yes, ma'am, it likely is. So for the, uh, for the sirloin, you rated from three to nine in this group. For the tenderloin, you rated from one to eight in this group. For the mock tender, you rated it from two to nine. For the flat iron cooked rare, you rated it from one to nine. For the flat iron cooked well, you rated it from one to nine. Okay? And now we'll get to our next sample, sample F. Okay. So, you can do all you can, but the consumer can still alter the product in the very end. All right. Another facet of tenderness is aging. And this is one that we've done some fantastic improvement on throughout, uh, throughout our, our industry and our history here. And so we're going to taste a little, of, uh, a little of that aging effect uh, here in just a moment. So one thing I want you to take away from this, if you're taking notes, is that aging is controlled by the Calpane enzyme system. Calpane. That enzyme system is native to your body. It's native in the living animal. And it is, it is part of the protein turnover process. So in cattle, they have a protein requirement because they're breaking down protein every day. I, I mentioned yesterday that in growth and development of animals, if you had a way to shut off protein turnover, that would be a gold mine because the cattle all of a sudden become very, very efficient because they're only accruing new protein. So this protein turnover is controlled by the calpane enzyme. It is inhibited by the calpostatin enzyme. So let's take that and go back to Bosyndicus cattle real quickly. Bosyndicus cattle in life have lower maintenance energy requirements. 
The reason they do is because they have naturally higher calipostatin levels in their muscle. They have lower protein turnover rates. That works fantastic in life. Then after life, in death as a carcass, those same higher calpostatin rates slow muscle aging and inhibit calpain activity and a bos indicus animal will be tougher than and will age slower than a bos taurus animal. Okay? We've done significant improvement in our industry to increase aging times to improve tenderness of muscle because this is one thing that can be well controlled by our beef processing system. So you can see uh, our most recent National Beef Tenderness Survey done in 2015-2016. Retail steaks, so think something that you would purchase at a supermarket. The average aging time is 26 days. But it has ranged in the most recent audit from 6 to 102. Six days, that's pretty quick. Get into the packer. 102. Aging time is from into a box till it's purchased. So it would actually, you would actually add 24 to 72 hours, so one to three days to that because it, it didn't start when the animal died. Now, aging technically starts at death. But in the survey, they're looking at box pack dates. So this box was produced on Tuesday. Yes, under vacuum. And that's okay. Meat ages under vacuum. Meat ages as long as it's not frozen. Doesn't matter if it's in a vacuum, out of a vacuum. It's aging as long as it's not frozen. This, this case, it's primarily wet aging, yes. So dry aging, and we're going to, you, you tasted a dry aged sample. Dry aging is the process of aging the meat out of the vacuum package. The enzyme systems are still working in the same manner. That does not change the enzymes. What it does is allows fats to oxidize. So we take a piece of meat and we expose it to oxygen. Over time, the fats will oxidize or become rancid and they develop a unique, uh, almost nutty flavor from the rancidity process. And some people prefer that and pay more for it. Some people shy away from it. Particularly, you know, it depends on, on their flavor profile. But it is an oxidation process. The other thing that will also happen is the muscle loses water to the environment, all of the flavors become more concentrated and the muscle cuts actually become richer in flavor, richer in protein flavor, richer in oxidized fat flavor, because there's less water to dilute the flavor. But it has to be under vacuum for that. No, no. It has to be under vacuum for wet aging. It has to be out of a vacuum, exposed to the environment for dry aging. Without any limit of humidity? No, that you, there's technically no limit. Most people try to control the humidity, yes. A common, a common humidity would be in the uh, 35 to 40 percent range during the dry aging process. Yeah. Okay. And a, and a food service product. So think restaurant, aged on average a little bit longer than a retail. But uh, we're doing fantastic in, in at least in our system of of aging times to improve palatability. Now let me take a time out for a minute and let me ask the different countries, do you know or what's your perception of how long a product is aged before the consumer gets it? What's your perception? What's your perception? Yeah, how long do you think your products are aged before people get them? Three, four days maximum. Three, four days maximum. In the supermarket. In the food serve for the retail, the, the day after, after the slaughterhouse, the carcass, carcass because we sell everything in carcass, they directly go to the platform 
from where the day after they are in the desk of the supermarket. So no aging or minimal aging. No aging. No. There is only one group right now, group distribution, mm -hmm. as Luga, that the minimum aging is 10 days. But yep. Only one. So I would advise between 28 and 35 days of aging to improve palatability. Sure, sure. So we don't have the storage, the, the store to storage uh, the chilling. Uh, sure, sure. And also the no space. And also the money that st they are invested stopped before be in the, in the desk of the supermarket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the main problem. Long aging or pumps? Long aging. Yes. Good. So around uh, 20, 20 days. 20 days? 20 okay. 24 hours. <laughs> Wet market? Or? But you do get, like I said the other night, you get the two markets. You get the one market, the, the local guys, you know, just order one day, next day it's on the plate. And there's the guy that's more focused on the quality, that will wait for 20, 28 to 35 days. Yeah, yeah. So, so small market. a small market. What is the optimized period of maturity? Aging? Maximum, you reach the you reach the peak at 35 days. This is the optimized maturity of the milk. The 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 age post mortem. No, when you slaughter. When you slaughter. Yes, we go from muscles to meat. Yes. What is the optimized period we have to let the animals for to have the good maturity? 35 days. 35. That would be optimal. Okay, I want to talk briefly about uh, shear force, but before I get to that, let's, let's finish these, uh, these samples. So, I need to, yeah, we need to do H and I. H and I. Let me uh, load this back up, and then I'll talk about tenderness in an objective manner, and we'll wrap this up. Because the next ones are a little bit interesting. Okay, H, eight, seven, two, six. Can you read angels? Nine. Okay. Six and five. Nine, eight, eight, six. Nine. Five, eight, eight, five, nine, nine, five. They didn't like that one, Travis. Six, six, four, three, seven, five, five, eight, seven, six, 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 seven, two, three, nine. Eight. Okay. So, sample H was a 6.4, uh, equivalent to the mock tender, in your opinion. Hmm. Price, totally different. But we'll get to that. Okay, sample I. Six. Five. Five. Eight. 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 Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. Five. One. Five. Five. Four, two and four, one, one, two, one, nine, three, four, two, two, four, three, two, four, one, three, one, four. Six, two, three, four, three, two, four, one, two, one, two, one. All right. You like that the best? That was 
So product I was 2.9, product H was 6.4. Okay, so let's get into what was what. So uh, product F, product F, you rated a four and a half, but the range, let me give you the range, product F ranged from two to nine. Kind of typical for this group. <laughs> All right. Product F was a select longissimus strip loin that was eight days old. We killed it a week ago yesterday. So it had only been aging eight days total, and that's from death. So more, in their world, it would have been more like five days of aging. Eight days aging, and it was aged in a vacuum package, so eight days of vacuum package aging uh, from a select animal that we killed last week. Okay. G was the other end of the spectrum. You rated it 4.3, but some of you hated that sample. G was also scored 2 to 9. And I remember several of you did not like that. That was a prime, dry-aged for 45-plus days. Yeah. People pay a premium for that stuff. Some of you did not like it. How many days? 45-plus. It's, it's, it was been around a while. Yeah, yeah. But I think some of our out-of-country guests did not like the dry-aged, long-aged, prime, oxidized flavor. Oh, it's same, same cut. Longissimus muscle, strip, a strip, yeah. Same muscle, different grades, different aging, different time. G was, yeah, F and G. That was a, a longissimus muscle. Okay, sample H met all the marketing bells and whistles. All natural, never ever, antibiotic, no hormone, and the biggest one of all, grass fed. <laughs> and we didn't, go over, we didn't go after one of them fake grass feds. Let me tell you, when, uh, when Dr. Tennant and I picked these samples out, we, we had to go to the grocery store for this one. They had what we call fake grass fed. It had about a quarter inch of back fat on it and the most pearly white marbling. That ain't grass fed. That's corn fed and they just lie on the label. It, it the come in and... Sure. What it might, okay, grass on grain. Yeah. yeah. What is it this one was like yellow, fat, dark, ugly red. This was a real deal grass fed. But it had all the bells and whistles on the marketing. It was like $15 a pound. For this stuff. You, it, it was a strip. A strip. You rated it the same as a mock tender. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Is the ranch still? Two to nine. Two to nine. Two to nine. Two to nine. And the last one meets all the same bells and whistles, a completely different program. I shouldn't say it meets all the same bells and whistles, most of them. So the last sample is an all-natural NHTC, no antibiotic, never ever program, but this time it's corn-fed and prime. You rated it a 2.9 and the range was from one to nine. A strip two, yep. So let, just a quick wrap up and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, I want to give you two slides here to tell you that uh, we in meat science rate tenderness as typically the most important thing we're going to objectively measure. And so the old gold standard is to take a Warner Bratzler shear force of tenderness. So we'll take a steak, in this case a, a strip loin, we'll cook it to a constant temperature, typically about 71 degrees Celsius. We'll chill it for 24 hours under a constant temperature again. We'll take a core and we'll pull out typically six cores per steak and then we'll cut it in half with a shear machine. And this is the old 
standard created in 1932. A more modern version of that same technology is to cook it and then slice it hot. And you take one sample rather than six, and uh, this is what we call slice shear force technology. It was developed by Dr. Uh, Stephen Shackelford at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in the uh, mid to late 1990s. And his goal to do this was to put shear force collection into slaughterhouses. And so the thought process was, we're going to take a steak at the same time we rib the carcass. We're going to cook it extremely quickly. We're going to slice it. And by the time it reaches the grater, we'll know how tough and tender it was. And so he developed a system that never happened, but it's now used as a shear force determination system. And let me say from, uh, on behalf of Dr. Tennant and myself, thank you for coming. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure to host you, and we're glad you're here. If you have any questions, all of these slides have our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to answer anything we can for you.